Hey guys, welcome back to my series looking at Tolkien's improbable star-crossed romances between members of the different peoples of Middle-earth. Earlier we talked about the unique case of Thingol and his wife Melian, the only known case of an elf marrying one of the Ainur. I pointed out several reasons why even the possibility of such a marriage was surprising, and the strange dynamic that must have existed between Thingol and his beloved, who was his equal in dignity, but far exceeded him in age, wisdom, and power. Given these quirks, it makes sense that Thingol and Melian are the only known elf Maya couple. Elves and humans, though, are a different story. They are conceived as sibling races, the elder and younger children of Iluvatar, the incarnates whose souls inhabit their physical bodies in a unique union. And indeed, we see half-elves and quarter-elves and humans with elven ancestry all over Middle-earth, so we know that they can and have interbred. Elves and men have many shared values and experiences. Certainly, they relate to each other more than they could to one of the Ainur. There's often some friction between the two peoples, but also real regard and frequently deep friendship. Indeed, Tolkien often describes the two peoples as being closely akin, different in their abilities and destinies but fundamentally similar, reporting in one letter that, in his mind, elves represent, really, men with greatly enhanced aesthetic and creative faculties. In another letter, Tolkien states elves and men are evidently, in biological terms, one race, so there's also no physical barriers to their marrying. Yet elven-human marriages are as rare as they are important, and to understand why that is we need to look at one of the saddest love stories Tolkien wrote, a romance between an elven lord and a human woman that does not end in a happily or even a bittersweetly ever after. We need to look at the story of Andreth and Ignor. There are very few details recorded about these two, but here's the gist of what Tolkien did give us. Ignor is a son of Finarfin and a brother of Finrod and Galadriel. With his other brother, Angrod, he protects the region of Dorthonion, where the first house of the Edain, the people of Beor, will settle a few centuries into the Siege of Angband. One morning as the sun rises, Agnor comes upon a young woman of this house standing in the hills of Dorthonion, Andreth, the sister of Bregor and eventually the great aunt of Beren. As one would expect of Tolkien characters who have a chance encounter in an extremely scenic setting, the two fall in love. However, Agnor does not pursue the relationship. Though Andreth knew that he returned her love, or could have done so if he had deigned to, he had not declared it, but had left her. As Andreth grows from a maiden into a wise woman of her clan, educated in the lore of her people and close in friendship with the similarly erudite Finrod, Ignor returns to war on the northern borders. With their love remaining not only unconsummated, but unspoken, their relationship is literally over before it starts. Yet neither Andreth nor Ignor ever pursue other partners. Ironically, Andreth seems to have outlived her elven paramour, as Ignor is slain with Angrod in the opening assault of the Battle of Sudden Flame, some forty years after he takes his leave of her. Andreth herself, a very old woman at that point, is noted by Tolkien as likely dying shortly thereafter as Morgoth overruns the region. This story is buried pretty deeply in the lore, so it's not surprising that it's not more widely known. Ignor only appears a handful of times in the published Silmarillion, and Andreth is not even listed in the Index. There are a few glancing references scattered throughout some of the later writings, but most of what we know about these two comes from a very odd little story-slash-essay, probably written around 1959, called Athrobeth Finrod a Andreth, or The Debate of Finrod and Andreth. According to Tolkien's own commentary on the text, this work is meant to be an example of the kind of thing that inquiring minds on either side, the elvish or the human, must have said to one another after they became acquainted, dramatized as a dialogue between Finrod, the king of Nargothrond, and his friend Andreth. While Tolkien maintains that the essay is part of the portrayal of the imaginary world of the Silmarillion, and not presented as an argument of any cogency for men in their present situation, he plays with many themes in this scenario, including how such concepts as original sin and the incarnation might appear in the context of Middle-earth. But while most of the dialogue is centered on such lofty thoughts, the text also works on a dramatic level. The main position taken by Andreth, one shared by many readers of Lord of the Rings, is that it simply doesn't seem fair that elves should have indefinitely long life and eternal physical vigor, while men, so like elves in other ways, should so quickly suffer illness, decay, grief, and finally permanent death. Finrod questions whether this position is really defensible, or if it is due instead to misunderstandings of the nature of men and elves. The tension rises as Andreth becomes increasingly bitter over this injustice, until Finrod flat out tells her that he knows the real reason she's upset is because of her love for his brother, at which point their conversation becomes more transparent. It's actually fitting that the only writing we have on Andreth and Ignor is this hybrid between a Socratic dialogue and a short story, because nowhere is the personal so entangled with the philosophical as in their relationship. 
As far as we know, this is the first mention of one of the Eldar falling in love with one of the Edain, and the couple has had to decide whether or not to act on that love. Ignor has chosen not to act on it, while Andreth, well, it seems like she would have chosen differently. Ignor's rejection leaves her hurt, humiliated, and angry, and questioning why, if elves and men can love each other, they shouldn't marry. Understandably, she attributes this to the perception that elves look down on humans, and believes Ignor was reluctant to marry a woman who had become weakened and disfigured by age pretty much immediately by elven standards. She tells Finrod, We are children to you, to be loved a little, maybe, and yet creatures of less worth, upon whom ye may look down from the height of your power and your knowledge, with a smile or with pity or with a shaking of heads. Finrod disabuses her of this because, as it turns out, Ignor has some very specific reasons for not wanting to get involved with anyone at the moment. Adoneth, I tell thee, Iconar the sharp flame loved thee, but too soon in the north wind his flame will go out. Foresight is given to the Eldar in many things not far off, though seldom of joy, and I say to thee, thou shalt live long in the order of your kind, and he will go forth before thee, and he will not wish to return. This is a time of war, Andreth, and in such days the elves do not wed or bear child, but prepare for death, or for flight. Finrod, moreover, points out that to have any hope of a life together would involve both Andreth and Ignor forsaking their duties to their families and their peoples, abandoning their collective efforts to contain Morgoth, and fleeing east or south, leaving Dorthonian to be overrun, and that even if they had tried this, thou hast said thyself that there is no escape by flight within the bounds of the world, and the devastation of Morgoth would have eventually caught up with their family. For Ignor, like most Eldar, romantic love, marriage, and starting a family are all part of the same impulse. And according to Tolkien's explorations of elven attitudes towards marriage, in the begetting, and still more in the bearing, of children, greater share and strength of their being, in mind and in body, goes forth than in the making of mortal children. It would seem to any of the Eldar a grievous thing if a wedded pair were sundered during the bearing of a child or while the first years of its childhood lasted, for which reason the Eldar would beget children only in days of happiness and peace if they could. Ignor, like Finrod, is convinced that Morgoth is soon to break the Siege of Angband and will deliver untold ruin upon the world, and so to take any wife or start a family would be considered the height of selfishness and irresponsibility. Finally, Finrod wonders if Andreth's love really would outweigh her pride as time went on. She claims, I would not have troubled him when my brief youth was spent, I would not have hobbled as a hag after his bright feet when I could no longer run beside him. But Finrod argues that Ignor, who truly does love Andreth, would not leave her side, and that Andreth's pride would make her dependence on Ignor's compassion a torturous experience for them both. So you feel now, but do you think of him? He would not have run before thee, he would have stayed at thy side to uphold thee. Then pity thou wouldst have had in every hour, pity inescapable. He would not have thee so shamed." Andreth voices objections to this, which makes sense. The expectation of decay, senescence, and ultimate grief are part of every mortal's life. The end is always cruel for men, she says. Humans know that everything they do will one day end in death, an event they view with fear, horror, anguish, and disgust. So, since death is inevitable and time is short, humans have a strong incentive to seize any opportunity for happiness they can find, even if such happiness is brief and mixed with pain. After all, for humans, there isn't any other kind of happiness. In Notes on Ore, one of Tolkien's digressive essays on elven language stems, he describes the effect this awareness of their limited lifespans has on men. All desires of the mind and the body were far more imperious than men than in elves. Peace, patience, and even full enjoyment of present good were greatly lessened in men. By an irony of their fate, though their personal expectation of it was brief, men were always thinking of the future, more often with hope than dread. By a similar irony, the elves, whose expectation of the future was indefinite, were ever more and more involved in the past, and in regret, i.e., in longing for the past, though their memories were, in fact, laden with sorrows. It seems that this really is a fundamental difference between elves and men, and not just a question of tendency or mood. Ignor's Quenya name is Iconaro, Fell Fire, and he is known for his ferocity and wrath in battle. Andreth, on the other hand, is sometimes named Silent, Wise Heart and is renowned for her patience and good judgment. Yet it is Ignor who exercises restraint and prudence, and Andreth who is passionately frustrated at what she sees as a missed opportunity. Thus Andreth is taking a characteristically human stance when she boldly claims, For one year, one day of the flame, I would have given all, kin, youth, and hope itself, Adoneth I am. Finrod responds by pointing out Ignor can't help his elven perspective any more than Andreth can help her manish one. That he knew, and he withdrew, and did not grasp what lay to his hand, Elda he is. 
for such barters are paid for in anguish that cannot be guessed until it comes, and in ignorance rather than encourage the Eldar judge that they are made. This is where things get fun, because at this point you realize it's this difference in point of view that's been at the heart of all of Finrod and Andreth's abstract wrangling. Both lacked important details about the other's perspective, and this initially caused them each to misjudge the other's argument. Finrod was of course well aware of the human inferiority complex around their short lifespans, and he has grieved many generations of human friends separated from him by death. But in the beginning of their conversation, he doesn't understand why Andreth, whose wisdom he respects, would consider this unfair. The elves' lore and their observations of human peculiarities suggests that, considered apart from the obvious evils of sickness and rapid aging, death is a unique ability of humans to transcend Arda, their special gift. Andreth has heard this explanation, but disagrees with it. The wise among men say we were not made for death, nor born ever to die. Death was imposed upon us. Hearing this idea expressed as part of an ancient tradition, rather than as a casual statement, is new for Finrod. He has heard the claim that men were meant to be immortal, but thought that this idea stemmed from their envy for the elves. Now he learns from Andreth that this idea is embedded in human tradition, and apparently predates mankind's exposure to elven immortality. He further infers that men blame Morgoth for their loss of eternal life. Andreth won't elaborate on the stories she's heard about Morgoth's early dealings with men, but Finrod says that if it was indeed Morgoth that inflicted involuntary and inescapable death on a once immortal people, well then they're all way more screwed than even he thought. To change the doom of a whole people of the children, to rob them of their inheritance? If he could do that in Eru's despite, then greater and more terrible is he by far than we guessed. Then all the valor of the Noldor is but presumption and folly. Nay, Valinor and the mountains of the Pelori are builded on sand. On the other hand, Finrod is fairly confident that men were intended by Eru to be fundamentally different from elves, in both nature and fate, and his observations confirm to him that death is somehow an expression of that difference. So he persists in arguing that there must be some kind of misunderstanding, or darkening of the mind, behind this belief, and concludes if involuntary death was imposed upon mankind, it would have required an act of Eru, and thus is not solely a phenomenon of Morgoth's malice. Andreth claims that it's easy for elves to take such an optimistic view of it, since they don't ever have to worry about the kind of early, permanent, and inevitable death that all men do. She grants that elves can be killed, but that this is often avoidable, and the elves know from direct experience that even being forcibly severed from their bodies will not force them out of Arda, and they may generally hope to return to bodily life. Finrod informs Andreth that this is actually the source of a problem for elves. On the upside, they never have to leave Arda. But on the downside, they never can leave Arda. And according to the elves, Arda itself will one day end. You see us, the Quendi, still in the first ages of our being, and the end is far off, but the end will come. That we all know. And then we must die. We must perish utterly, it seems, for we belong to Arda in Hroa and Fea. And beyond that, what? The going out to no return, as you say? The uttermost end? The irremediable loss? Our hunter is slow-footed, but he never loses the trail. Now it's Andreth's turn to be surprised, and no wonder. Elves are typically described as immortal or undying. They certainly don't age the same way that humans do, and on casual observation it seems as though they just go on forever. But from the perspective of the elves, their fate is worse than that of men. Not only do they have to endure the griefs and losses of millennia of life, and bear the increasing weariness of living in a world that has long ceased to offer any new prospects or hope of lasting happiness, but they also live with the knowledge of their own inevitable end. Unlike men, who don't know what will happen after their death, and so fear it, elves have a pretty good idea of what their fate will be. Their lives will be ended, their physical bodies destroyed like the rest of material reality, and if their spirits do persist, it will be as permanently disembodied beings that exist only in the past. The elves, the great creators of Middle-earth, will be unable to make or do anything ever again. Their personalities finished, their whole experience reduced to a memory. Reflecting on this really makes one reconsider why elves seem so annoyingly cautious sometimes. They believe that, barring some unforeseen divine intervention, the nature of which they cannot predict, their ultimate fate seems to be to exist only as the sum of their memories for eternity. Mortals like Andreth know that eventually all their triumphs and regrets will become irrelevant, because they will someday have to leave Arda forever. Elves like Ignor believe that their regrets will become part of their eternal reality. It's no wonder then that Ignor chooses to forgo what he knows will ultimately become a bitter, painful memory of slow decay, loss, regret, and very likely mutual resentment, 
in favor of holding the untainted memory of his unconsummated but pure love for Andreth in his mind and heart forever. So Andreth was right in her belief that it was her mortality, in part, that caused Ignor to turn away from her. But she was mistaken in thinking that this was due either to his distaste for the infirmities of aging, or else his reluctance to marry someone whose short life would not represent a very good return on investment, to state the matter coldly. Finrod believes it's much more serious than that. Men and elves possess separate dooms by design, and to attempt to unite two individuals of such different natures in marriage is, by definition, unwise. Perilous is it to cross a gulf set by doom. And should any do so, they will not find joy upon the other side, but the griefs of both. Nay, Adonath, if any marriage can be between our kindred and thine, then it shall be for some high purpose of doom. Brief it will be, and hard at the end. Yea, the least cruel fate that could befall would be that death should soon end it. You may be thinking that this doesn't sound particularly comforting. And you'd be right, because at this point in the conversation, Andreth has progressed to open weeping. Finrod may have succeeded in soothing Andreth's stung pride and persuading her that separation from Ignor, hard as it seems, is actually the least terrible outcome of their love. But he's also emphasized that her union with Ignor is impossible, not just in her lifetime, not just for the duration of the world, but probably for all eternity. Nevertheless, Finrod is able to offer some faint hope. He's had something of an epiphany while listening to Andreth speak about the original destiny of mankind. In men's persistent belief, however garbled by generations of retelling, that they were originally meant to be both eternal and permanently embodied, he intuits an idea he's never had before. He discerns that the unique ability of men to fully inhabit Arda as incarnates, while not being bound to it, might somehow facilitate the renewal of Arda. What can this mean unless it be that the Fea shall have the power to uplift the Hroa as its eternal spouse and companion, into an endurance everlasting beyond Ea and beyond time? Thus would Arda, or a part thereof, be healed not only of the taint of Melkor, but released even from the limits that were set for it in the vision of Eru of which the Valar speak. This, then, I propound was the errand of men, not the followers, but the heirs and fulfillers of all, to heal the marring of Arda. For that Arda healed shall not be Arda unmarred, but a third thing, and a greater, and yet the same, Arda remade. And there the Eldar completed, but not ended, could abide in the present forever and their walk may be with the children of men their deliverers, and sing to them such songs as even in the bliss beyond bliss should make the green valleys ring and the everlasting mountaintops to throb like harps." I find it important to note at this point that Andreth's response in the text to Finrod's Rhapsody is to glare at him, and to ask if the elves would ever stop singing to say anything actually sensible. Finrod guesses that despite their different natures, because of the friendship and love between elves and men, the new creation that men could bring about must likewise bring some measure of fulfillment to the elves. This is the high purpose of doom that would justify the necessary suffering involved in a marriage between elf and man. The physical uniting of the two peoples through the eventual establishment of the half-elven line will be an important element in redeeming not just men, but elves as well. Indeed, in Tolkien's commentary on the text, he identifies this as one of the effects that makes Baron and Luthien's unlikely romance so significant. From the union of Luthien and Baron, which was made possible by their return from death, the infusion of a divine and an elvish strain into mankind was to be brought about, providing a link between mankind and the Elder World after the establishment of the Dominion of Men. This link, which will become part of humanity's very DNA, provides the faint glimmer of hope for any kind of final reunion between men and elves. And so, when Finrod takes his leave of Andreth, having foreknowledge of both his brothers and his own fast approaching demise, he tells Andreth to await her beloved, and his meddlesome older brother, when she departs Arda. Because for the first time, Finrod believes that such a meeting is possible. And later, when the haggard mortal Baron begs Finrod for aid in winning the hand of a semi-divine elven maiden, and Finrod feels his doom closing around him, he must also realize that the sacrifice he's being called to make will allow his brother and his friend, along with all other elves and humans who have been grieved by their sundering, a chance at the lasting happiness that they otherwise might never get. But that, of course, is a different story. If you enjoyed this video, act with the haste characteristic of men to seize the fleeting pleasures of hitting the like button. Subscribe to narrow the dreadful gulf between my other videos and your eyeballs. And thank you for watching.